It's time for the Monday Way in as we look back on last Saturday's fight between Vasil Lomachenko and Nicholas Walters, how the fight played out, and what's next for these two warriors, and of course, much more. That's all coming up on the Way in Everybody, I am Jason Abelson, your Boxcaster host, joined by my production editor, Tristan Smith. How are you doing, Tristan? Hey, how are you? I'm good. A little disappointed in the fight, I have to tell you. It wasn't what I thought it was. I thought it would be a firefight. Instead, it was uh, it was a clinic followed by a submission, and uh, a little disappointing. Yeah, no fireworks, except for on one side. Well, you know, it started off very tentative. You know, both guys obviously feeling their way through, and it was Lomachenko that began doing what he does, which was you know, working in the angles, beginning to begin to get a little more on the shots. And as the fight progressed, especially going into the seventh round, that's where he, he really began to be the Vasil Lomachenko that we've come to know and love. And that's when he essentially ended the fight, landing his first shots of real, uh, real damage. And then Walters, I guess, just saw the writing on the wall and said, no moss, if you will. Yeah, he quit. He got hurt. In the previous round, decided not to come out. Um, last week, I picked Walters to win. That's because he's Jamaican, and I was riding on that. And you got, but, to, got to break out the patois. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, I said all the tools that Lomachenko had to win, which was the angles, uh, the multiple punches. He throws a lot of punches, and that became a factor in the fight. I think everything that was going on behind the scenes was affecting Walters mentally. Uh, Bob Aaron calling Lomachenko the next Ali just like things in a promotion that made him seem like he was the opponent. And, and he was uh, waiting 300 days to fight. That obviously was in his head as well. Yeah, the the, the layoff. But that's more on him than anybody else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it could could have been his promoter also, maybe. The promoter's promoting a fight. You've got the A-sider, the A-side. He's going he's gonna to build the guy up. And he didn't say any bad words about about Walters. He kept saying that this is you know, a very dangerous fight for Lomachenko. Walters is a, a punishing puncher. He comes to fight. I mean, he played up the fight. He, he wasn't just saying this is the Lomachenko show. He no. was saying this was you know a good fight between these guys, but there's one guy that obviously is a star and one guy that's the B-fighter. But in the post-fight, Walters used that as an excuse. He was saying they're giving this guy all the fights I haven't fought in a year. So that made me think that um, behind the scenes, Bob wasn't really – Offering him anything that he should have taken. Well, I mean that that, and Bob does have a history of that, Mikey he, he Garcia. He does, you know, but he, <clears throat> you know, he offered Walters six hundred thousand dollars earlier in the year. Walters wanted a million. Walters ended up getting three hundred thousand. Then he ends up quitting in the fight. They got three hundred thousand, and I doubt in the next fight he's going to get fifty thousand. I mean, he went for a million in his mind, down to fifty in reality, in the course of seven rounds. Yeah. I think all the hype behind Lomachenko and the things that were going on behind the scenes to make Walters feel the way he did played out into how he fought in that fight. Uh, so especially, you, wait, so do, you, do you think that everything being equal, that Walt, that Lo, Walters puts up a better fight against Lomachenko? I think if people were, you know what, it's I can't even put the blame on the other factors. I'm just saying it, it contributed to how he was thinking and his mental state. Because ultimately, it's up to the fighter to deal with that stress and, and those problems and to get by it and fight, bring the fight come fight night and bring the performance that is expected of him and what he's getting paid for. But I, I'm not going to ignore the fact that uh, that he was seen as, you know, the B-side and was treated like the B-side. And uh, no one gave him a chance, really, except for me. And yeah. Well, yeah, oh, well. well, I was we, we all we all say yeah, yeah we all say stuff Monday morning like what was I what was I thinking no I <laughs> see you know I I thought this would be a competitive fight I mean I really didn't uh, you know I, I didn't pick Walters to to knock out Lomachenko but I definitely I definitely thought in my mind he would bring enough to the table to to make this a competitive fight as opposed to an exhibition I mean it really was a case of one guy absolutely being there and not being spectacular but just by doing what he does. He was heads, heads above whatever Walters could bring. Like when you saw when uh, Michael Buffer was announcing their names, you could see in Nicholas's eyes that he wasn't really there. And then, you know, you see 
the subtle things of Lomachenko playing the same uh, ring entrance or the same moves that Walters was doing. Just to get into Walters' said a little bit, some people didn't pick that up. I picked that up immediately. But everything just played out to how Nicholas, towards the end of that round, started looking into the crowd. I don't know what he was looking at. He was looking at the crowd, looking over Lomachenko's shoulder at someone else. And the way he walked to his corner and put his hand on the ropes, you could tell he just didn't want to fight no more. That's too bad if you're a fighter. You, you got to bring it, you know, and I, I went on a lot last week about going easy on guys that quit in the middle of the fight. Yeah. But that was really for guys, though, had, who have taken a beating, you know, and mm-hmm. I pointed out Victor Ortiz specifically. And Ortiz is a guy that got fricasseed for quitting with a broken jaw, Yeah, you know, for quitting after being beaten up by Maidana. Marcos Maidana. Mm-hmm. I, there's almost there's. You, know, you can't blame a guy in that position to look out for his well-being and say, okay, enough's enough. However, what did what did Walters go through that was so exceptional in that fight that you would say, you know what, he really should quit just to save his future? You know, Because right now it seemed to me he just quit because of the basic, basic risks of being a boxer, of getting hit and maybe hurt a little. Well, in my opinion, he got tagged a lot in the seventh round, and we, we got to— this is something we do in boxing a lot. We got to stop generalizing everybody. Every person who comes to fight is significantly different from another person. Their their mindsets, what they come to do this for, whether they're there to support their family or they get a, a, a new life. Maybe they're escaping Cuba or Russia. Everyone's there for their own reasons. And I feel like in that moment when Walters got hurt, he was like, this is not worth whatever he started boxing for. Maybe he's like, I can fight another day. Or maybe he's like, you know what? I've done enough in boxing. And truly, I brought, I brought, he probably was thinking, I brought you guys enough fights before, enough great fights that I don't feel like I, I, maybe I could take this one off and just quit. You know, and if this was his last fight and he never fights again, I totally understand that mentality. If he leaves the ring Saturday thinking, all right, what's next, Bob? Well, (laughs) if I'm Bob Arum or if I'm HBO, yeah, I'm not sure I'm returning that call right away because mm-hmm. I don't think there is anything immediately for the guy. What do you say to – if you're Bob Arum, you don't really tell a TV executive, hey, I got Nicholas Walters. He's due for a fight. Where can we slot him in? Yeah. Well, because that TV executive is going to be too thrilled to have him back on the network. And that's fair. That's something Nicholas is going to have to live with for the rest of his life. People calling him a quitter, people calling him names, and things of that nature. Um, yeah, he's going to have to live with that. But in terms of the people that are calling on quitters, I, I feel like you should try to understand it from the fighter side. I know I know we, we expect all the top guys to be like, you, I'm going to fight with, the, with my shield and, and die in the ring. But some of these guys are a bit more realistic. Some of them are like, hey, I would love to see my daughter tomorrow. You know, you can't I, blame them. You know, I, and I get that. And, you know, if you're... If you're someone who, you know, is staring the fact that you're going to get, you've already been beaten up over the course of a fight, and you're probably going to get more coming at you, and you think, okay, you know, I'm already hurt. It's time to, you know, get out of this. Let's call it a day, take a knee, whatever. Okay, I, I get that. And maybe if if that's your last fight, totally, that's totally fine. I mean, Eric Morales, when he sat down against Manny Pacquiao, he took a beating. And he was on his pants, and he looked to his corner. He said, no, I'm not getting up. Mm-hmm. Nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's almost noble and intelligent to not get up under those circumstances. Mm-hmm. And he ended up fighting again. But, you know, he reached a moment where he's like, you know what, I, I can't do this anymore tonight. And you understood that because it, he had put up such a struggle. Yeah, it, Walters didn't give us anything to look forward to. Mm as far as his future or anything to look back on as far as his performance that night. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't come back, then you know what? Then he made the right decision because there's no point putting yourself through the ringer in something futile. But if he does expect to, there is a price to be paid. In his post-fight interview, he said that he was in survival mode. He got hit with a few shots and he was trying to hold on to Lomachenko, which tells you that he thought he was going to get knocked out. And he even said himself that what what am I supposed to do? Come out the next round and and continue when I know I'm going to get knocked out? That's just stupid. So you can see logically where he's coming from. So what happens I, the next time he gets in the ring and he thinks he's going to get? I knocked think he, out? I think he needs to be. I think in in that case also, just coming from a perspective of a fighter, I think he's too used to being the bully. 
I think he's too used to being the power puncher, the coming down, walking guys down, hurting them, watching them get hurt. And then when he came in front of a guy who was a lot better than him and could punch also deep in, in, the, in the late rounds, which actually counts more than in the earlier rounds. Well, actually, that's debatable. But anyways, he's never faced that before. He's like, oh, my God, I have no chance. I'm too used to being the bully. Now I'm getting bullied. No, that says a lot. That's not a, that's not, yeah, that's, that's a problem. Yeah. That's a problem. Cause it, that's the prospect's mindset. You know, a guy that gets brought up and he's always a favorite and he wins and then, you know, he loses. How does he handle defeat after that? Yeah. Where do you go from there? Where does your career go? You were seeing some guys go through that right now. Gary Russell, you know, after losing to the same Vasil Lomachenko, you know, he's looking for something. You know, speaking of Gary Russell, you know, that name was brought up at, to Bob Arum as a possible opponent for Lomachenko in the wake of Saturday's win. Um, yeah, that'd be an interesting fight again. We've already seen that. Another name that we've already seen against Lomachenko that Aram discussed was uh, Orlando Salido, mm-hmm. the man who defeated Lomachenko in his second career fight, mm-hmm. and a man that people said may have the style going forward to constantly give Lomachenko a hard time just because Salido is such a strong fighter, a relentless dirty, if you will, that he'll always make it a dogfight, and that will always give Lomachenko a hard time. Do you see number two being any different than number one as far as a Salido Um I fight? think Vasil does better, but I think uh, Salido still frustrates him. And it, it's it's more than just him being dirty and those, those tactics that he was doing in the ring. I think Salido instinctively realized that Lomachenko was always trying to turn him, so he held him, so he wasn't able to turn him and kept going to his body to try and get that energy out of him for the late rounds, and it worked. You know, low blows here, there, headbutt here and there. But you know that it's a style. You can't blame him for being him. No, you know what I mean. It's him. That's you what can't. makes him so good. Yeah, it's him. Yeah, so man, if Salido was Mr. Polite in the ring. He never would have gotten past Lopez twice. And yeah. you know what? We wouldn't have known him uh, for anything other than kind of a B fighter. Yeah, you know, he's taken those tactics and his style. And his approach to the game and made himself a legitimate A T V fighter. Vasil definitely right now, in my opinion, is number one pound for pound. And until someone else proves me differently, then it's gonna stay that way. The only thing about Vasil that um I would be worried about is that he's showing a lot of things in boxing. That's been in boxing, but he's taking advantage of it, like the angles. And turning his opponents. He likes to turn you a lot. He likes to come from your blind side and try and hit you. And I think that's going to elevate the young fighters today to try and copy him and and emulate him to make their skill sets better. But what comes with that is that now we're going to start figuring out how to beat you. And that's what I was doing after the fight. I started watching more tapes on Vasil. And I was like, how would I beat Vasil? I would go to his body when he tries to turn me. Um, I'm a southpaw just like him. I would um, punch as he's trying to turn me because he doesn't pivot and turn and punch at the same time. He pivots, turns, and then punches. He does it in sequence. He he turns, then punches. So I would punch as soon as I noticed that he's about to turn. And if I was an orthodox fighter, I would hook him. I would use my left hand to hook him to keep him in front in line with my right hand and drop that straight down the middle and see how effective that is with going to the body too. And yeah, but how's your footwork? I mean, you got to keep, you got to match feet with this guy too, and that's that's his edge. It seems every time. Yeah, I'm sure everyone's got a plan, but then he's getting the ring with him, and he is all over the place. Yeah, and you know his hands are everywhere, but his feet are everywhere too, in a but, good way. But you know what makes him seem like he's all over the place is these guys are just standing still once Lomachenko starts throwing. He stands, they stand still, and then that. That makes it easier for him to get around you. That makes it easier for him to get behind you or your signs and your blind spots to hit you. You need to move with Lemachenko. You need to have lateral movement, and you can't just stand still when he's throwing. You have to move out the way. We play devil's advocate with you. Not straight backwards, but We play devil's lateral. advocate with you. Gary Russell Jr., when he fought Lomachenko, was very lateral. He was side to side. I mean, he wasn't spinning, but he was giving angles, yet Lomachenko still chased him down. Cut off the ring superbly. I mean, made that ring as small as you could possibly make it against a guy like Russell. And then once he was in close, he was still able to work the angles and and do everything against a mobile guy like Russell that he he did to Martinez, that he did to Walters. How how exactly is that gap going to be closed when you have a guy who who does everything he wants against different types of styles? I got a, I got an answer for you, and this this is the trick. Lomachenko 
looks like a brawler. He comes up with his ha- his guard h- held high, and then he gives you like this uh this bob and weave motion back and forth, back and forth. What makes it makes any fighter feel like he's gonna come and throw hard punches, but he's doing that to get you to throw to time you, and then he steps to the side and starts counter punching and throwing punches. And I think every fighter has made that mistake in in. Um, watching him bob and weave and thinking it's 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 either him coming for it as a brawler or it's a chess match and that's what keeps their feet plant planted still when they're boxing him they need to just keep moving don't worry about what he's doing focus on what you're doing and and know that at some point he's going to throw a combination he's going to and he's going to try to spin you he's going to try and turn you know that and i think you'll do a lot better than all these other fighters who just stand still and try and counterpunch him or, or just stand still and get tagged. And they're like, oh, God. And then they try and lean back and do all these other things that are not working, clearly. Well, so let's take a look at the landscape for Lomachenko right now. Because, you know, he's beaten pretty much everybody within that that weight range. So between 126, 130, and 135, I mean... There aren't too many names that stand out. I mean, you could say Linares at 135, mm-hmm. but I, I think Linares is fragile enough that he'll he'll cut through him like a hot knife through butter. Yeah, Linares is a good boxer, but he's not tall enough, in my opinion. And his reach, he, I think he might have the reach advantage, but I think Vasil eventually breaks him down. There's Robert Easter Jr., who's Broner's friend. Uh, he's 5'11". I think that'll give Vasil a little bit of problems. Um, there's Terry Flanagan. I think he gets demolished. Sorry, Terry. There's uh, a <laughs> there's there's Francisco Vargas, who Vasil called after the fight because uh, he wants to unify the titles. But even Bob himself said that if because uh, uh, he's Francisco's managed by Golden Boy, and he said that if Oscar's not willing to let Canelo fight Golovkin, then how the hell will he get uh, Francisco Vargas to fight uh, Vasil Lomachenko? But, Which I agree with too. And even if he does, it's going to be that's going to be a butchery. Yeah, I mean Vasil, the style is just tailor made for Lomachenko. I feel like Vasil has no competition from 126 all the way up to 147, with the exception of Errol Spence and maybe Terence Crawford. Oh, and also what? Who? He's not really on TV that much anymore because he just got out of, out of his uh. His contract uh, sell with Bob Aaron, but Mikey Garcia. Ooh, that's a good name. He was talking trash while watching the fight. That's a good name. And that's a name you didn't hear post-fight. And, you know, kind of didn't think of it just because because of that, the whole rift with Garcia and and Aram and the fact that, you know, uh, that Garcia is now on Showtime. He's fighting uh, as a teaching uh, in January. It should be a great fight. I mean, but unfortunately, that's where politics are probably going to get in the way. Yeah. Because I don't think Aram's going to want to do business with business with Garcia Mikey, right now after no, the no. after their uh, little fallout. But that would be a good fight. That'd be yeah. a terrific fight for uh, for Lomachenko. You know what? Bob might do it just to try and kill off Mikey and be like, "Ha, that's be. what you get for leaving me. You're done now." Could be. Could be a screw you type of fight. Yeah. Exactly. If you want it badly enough, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. That'd be a good fight. If uh, Garcia gets past the teaching, tell Vasil that he's going to give him twenty million extra if he, yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> if he no, completed Bob, this choice. Bob Aaron's <laughs> not parting with twenty million for anybody not named Pacquiao. Yeah, you no, know, but that would be uh, that'd be a good fight. Yeah, so the, but the options are limited. Mm-hmm. They they really are. So it's like three guys. It's too bad because this guy is so good, Lomachenko. Mm-hmm. You just hope there is more. Yeah, that's the disappointing thing about the Walters performance was that we didn't get one of those intermediary great tests where we see an inter- interesting fight, an exciting fight against a guy who's going to push Lomachenko. Mm-hmm. Then we saw a kind of a dull fight against a guy that just succumbed and gave in and waved the white uh, the white flag mm-hmm. it, with no moss spray-painted on it. So it's going to have to live with it. But I just want to say one thing on top of that. Max Kellerman and uh, Dan Raphael, I can't wait for you guys to get in the ring. Because you guys are a bit too harsh on these fighters, even when they quit and even when they, they take their lives into their own hands. I, I feel like your love of boxing is overthrowing the safety of these fighters. And if they honestly feel like they need to stop, you know, ease up a little bit, just a little bit. Tell yeah. them he quit. Yeah, he quit. We all know he quit. But but when you start questioning, like, 
uh, his manhood, you start calling him pathetic and that he's not like all these other greats, then then you're in an area that you're not accustomed to because you guys are not fighters. I feel like you guys deserve a punch in the face if you talk to a fighter like that directly in his face. Yeah, this is the divide, and it pops up in boxing more so than other sports. It exists in other sports, but the divide between the media and the actual athletes because in boxing, you can't even really empathize with what a fighter's going through. You know, you can have your ideas about how a fight should unfold and about how fighters should behave and what you love about a good fight. You could bring that to the ring, but you can't make that leap to the the empathetic leap to what the fighter's going through. And I think fighters, we see it here with, with Tristan, there's a resentment because they'll never know, yet they're judging you as if they do know. Yeah, yeah, based off of the fighters that they've seen in love. But I will, in, in defense of, because I am obviously having not laced them up in any competitive way, shape, or form, you know, at least see what the critics, like the the guys like like the merchants who's been who, who could be very critical of guys that don't show up and fight, the Raphaels, the Kellermans. We have a notion of what we how we romanticize fighters, how we lionize fighters. I mean, fight fans admire fighters so much, and if you if you deliver. On their vision, on a fight fan's vision of what a fighter is, there won't be a more beloved athlete in the world. Yeah. You mean guys that make more money, like Floyd. Floyd is not a fight fan's, you know, an old school blood and guts fight fan's type of fighter. But if you fit that mold, you know, if you're a Gotti, if you're like a Matthew Saad Muhammad, if you're a guy that pays that price and delivers fights, you will be... You'll have so much love thrown at you, you won't know what to do with it. Now you end up paying the price because those guys did not end up well. So, and that's the other thing that fight fans maybe look past is that, hey, I, I love a good fight, and you know they don't have to look after the fighter who needs a nursemaid after because he gave his blood and guts in the ring. You know, so it's I I totally get what you're saying, but I understand both sides, and especially you know what if it, if it was any other type of fight. If it was a fight that didn't have this ty- this kind of expectation, I think that was part of the problem. You know, the guy just gave up, and the fight that everyone envisioned just didn't happen. And so I think there's you know there's disappointment in how the fight turned out, and disappointment in Walters because everybody built Walters up as a dangerous, dangerous guy, and it's kind of shocking when it happens for the first time, and you realize, oh wow, we didn't know this guy, and so maybe that's when the responses in uh the reactions get maybe a little too extreme yeah anyway hopefully the next fight regardless who is a, a little better especially for lomachenko who i think we're all willing to see get tested just a little maybe salito's that guy yeah they should do that my salito's not getting any younger yeah yeah I, I think now's the time let's make that rematch happen let's settle that score and give fight fans another good fight action fight with Lomachenko. Tristan, thanks so much, buddy. No All right, if you like what you had to say, please let us know. Leave a comment. Click the like button like crazy. And of course, subscribe.